Yes? Uh, I think I've given out a couple of hundreds. Okay, so those of you that haven't graded yet, hopefully you'll get one of those really good scores, okay? I'll get them done. I'll get them done, okay? Um, and then uh, the maps, uh, I'll be working on those. Or hopefully Taylor's still there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lily was out of town all week. She usually grades this for me. All right, so let's get rolling. Am I recording? I am recording. All right. So, guys, last thing we left off was with the uh, Molotov, Ribbentrop Pact, or the non-aggression pact between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. Okay, which, guys, is, uh, is a big deal because the Nazis have said all along that the communists are the enemy. Okay, and what they're going to do is split Poland here. Okay, so this is actually the beginning of World War II. Uh, we can give it a date. All right. Sorry, my mouse is getting away from me. Wow, it really got away from me. Okay. So, here we go. Uh, Hitler will begin to threaten Poland, okay, and on September 1st, Hitler will invade Poland. So, a lot of his historians uh, say uh, September 1st, 1939 is the start of World War One. I. I like September 3rd because that's when Britain and France declare war on Nazi Germany. Okay, so I like the third plus. It's nine, three, three, nine. Okay, which is easier than nine, one, three, nine. Okay. Now, uh, Poland is going to fight, okay? The Czechs didn't fight, the Austrians didn't fight, right? The Albanians didn't fight, the Ethiopians fought, but not for very long, right? The Chinese are fighting against the Japanese, but they're losing badly. Okay, so um, Poland has got an army. They have an air force. They have tanks. It's just that most of that military technology is of the World War I era, whereas the Germans are using modern aircraft, modern tanks, uh, some of the best military equipment on the planet, and they've already got some experience, especially from the air. So you guys know what a biplane is, right? With two wings, right? That's what the Poles are flying. And the Germans are going to be flying um, aircraft, uh, really three types of aircraft. You've got bombers, dive bombers, and fighters. Okay, and they all have distinct purposes. This air power is going to allow uh, Germany with the fast-moving infantry and army, okay, to rapidly take over not just Poland, but all of Europe, okay? Now, there's a term for this type of warfare. Some of you know it. Go ahead, Sam. Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg, which means lightning warfare. Okay, I've got some stuff on that on the next slide, all right? And I'm going to go through and describe this for you guys so you get a better understanding of how effective this type of warfare was. Okay, so the Germans invade, okay, from the Western Front. Two weeks later, the Soviets invade from the Eastern Front, and poor Poland is caught in between. All right, so within a month of September 1st, by the end of September, Poland is divided takes about a month. Now, guys, Poland's a fairly large country as far as European countries go. You understand? And as I talked about before, you got Poland here in the middle between the USSR and Germany. Okay, the capital, Warsaw, is going to be on the German side. Okay? They come on September 1st, so really 90% of the Polish army is fighting on the Western Front. Only 10% of the Polish army is defending its flank, its rear, okay? Um, and so the Russians will move more rapidly. The Germans will take about a month to, to take Warsaw. And basically what the, the Poles do is they kind of fall back around Warsaw, around the capital, okay, as they, as they retreat. And the Germans will bring in heavy guns and bombers, howitzers and just lay waste to the city, okay? Uh, and the Poles will eventually 
surrender. Okay. Now, some Poles will escape, all right, and make it to Britain, um, uh, to France, other places. They'll, they'll escape. Okay. Um, the Polish resistance will last throughout the war. There will, there will always be resistance going on in many of these countries that are taken over by the Nazis. Okay. At some point, we know this, Hitler is going to carry out his plan of Lebensraum, or living room, living space, and he is going to invade the Soviet Union. Not yet. He's got to worry about his rear, okay, which is Western Europe. All right, now that Britain and France are in this war. All right, so let me go on to this, talk about this blitzkrieg. Uh, the U.S. does react after much debate. Congress will repeal the arms embargo. So now we can send you guns and bullets, planes and bombs, tanks and shells. All right. So finally, we're off the fence here a little bit. Now, we're not getting in the war. But we're going to choose sides here. Okay. All right. So this plane on the left, these two planes here, okay, these are Stuka dive bombers. The German Air Force, this is the German flying cross here, okay, is called the Luftwaffe. That's the German Air Force, okay. They are going to decimate, okay, the Polish. Okay, this is called a Stuka dive bomb. All right. Then you look at this picture in the middle. You've got tanks. You've got uh, trucks that carry troops. And then over here you see a column of motorcycles. Motorcycles with a sidecar. So each one of these motorcycles can carry three troops. All right, so the idea behind Blitzkrieg, guys, I'm going to go on to the next slide here, is to use air power and a fast-moving infantry to overwhelm an enemy. All right, so let me show you a couple more of these aircraft. The Stuka is a dive bomber, all right? This is a Messerschmitt. This is a fighter aircraft. And this is the Junkers 88, which is the German heavy bomber. Okay. So three types of aircraft, your heavy bomber, your fighter, and then on the previous slide, the Stuka dive bomber. All right. Here's a bit better picture of the sidecar with the motorcycle with three troops. Okay. This is an armored personnel carrier. And then the German tanks will continue to improve throughout the 1930s and throughout the war. So famously, um, you have a couple of German tanks that um, become notorious, okay? Anybody name one? Did you guys play video games with this stuff? Yeah. Okay, the Sherman's the American tank. Yeah. The Panzer tank. Yeah, and then the Tiger tank. Okay, the Tiger, actually, the late models of the Tiger are... The Sherman, the American tank, will not stand up to these tanks. The thing about the Sherman tank that we had going for us is numbers. We built a crap ton of them. Okay, so if we could gang up three to one on a Panzer or a Tiger with, a Sherman, with Sherman tanks, three to one, four to one, we had a chance. If it was one to one... That Sherman's going down. So we just built a ton of them. Right? And our tanks got better as the, as the war went on as well. Because you learn, you know, what's working and what's not. Okay? So guys, Blitzkrieg, lightning warfare, okay, depends on air power to strike with speed using the fastest new vehicles, airplanes, tanks, trucks, motorcycles. Okay? So let me describe for you guys how this is actually carried, carried out. When the Germans are going to invade a country, the first thing they're going to use is these bombers right here. Okay. Now I'm going to come back here to this map, this uh, picture up here. Okay. 
Uh, these are World War One aircraft over here. These are World War II aircraft, and these are more modern warplanes. And we actually have the X-35 here, uh, the F-17 Stealth. Um, I don't think we have the F-22 on here. Okay, we got the A-10, which is a badass plane. Um, but yeah, so well, yeah, there's the F-22 right there. So yeah, I mean, this, those are mine. Okay, but when we look at World War II aircraft, and I was at practice Saturday. And this one flew over, right over the baseball field. I don't know if you were there. Were you there when this flew over? Was it Saturday? Maybe it was Friday. Okay. This is a B-29. Okay. This is the largest bomber on this picture, right? These were built in Wichita. Okay. Now, these B-29s were mostly used exclusively, really, in the Pacific theater against Japan. Okay. So, when we talk about the European theater, We'll talk mostly about the B-17, which is here, the B-25 here, okay? So this is the B-17 and the B-25, the B-29. You also have the B-24, which, did I have anybody, I, who read Unbroken? Somebody in here? Okay, somebody in my other class read Unbroken, which is what they were flying in the book, okay? Now, let's go back to the Germans here. Okay, now if you look at the Junkers 88 group, this is their heavy bomber. It's much smaller than the American bombers. This is the British Lancaster. This is a Japanese bomber. Okay, this is a small bomber, so they're able to mass produce more of these. Okay, but what they're going to do is they're going to use this. Now, if you're going to attack a country from the air, what's the first thing, the first target, your strategy? Sam. Okay, you want to take out your their ammo? Okay, what else? Industry. So they can't make more tanks and guns and stuff, right? What else? Transportation, railroads, that sort of thing. Okay. So the first thing you're going to go after is their airfields. If you can take out their aircraft on the ground, while they're on the ground, like surprise them, then you have air superiority. You have the upper hand, both, both literally and figuratively, if you can take out their air force. Follow me? So that's the first target that the Germans are going to go after in every country. Okay, and if you have air superiority in modern warfare, guys, that is key to victory. Okay. World War II is an air war like we will never see again. We never saw one before like this, and we'll never see one another like that again. Because today we have smart weapons, we have cruise missiles. Okay, we don't need we have planes that you can fly from a from a bunker in California, you can fly in Afghanistan without a pilot. Okay, we are moving in that direction towards drones. Just like Star Wars. Right? Okay, now, so this is the heavy bomb. They're going to try and take out the enemy air force. They're going to take out their industry. You're going to take out their fuel depots. You know, get, get their gasoline. Get that. Okay, take those out. Take out trans railroads so they can't send in reinforcements on trains. All that sort of stuff, okay? And as soon as you're done with the heavy bombers, here come the tanks. Okay, you're going to come off in massive force with an armor, armored army, okay? And covering that armored army are going to be these stupid dive bombers. So what the dive bombers do is they come in right in front of the tanks and they take out enemy tanks, they take out enemy artillery. Anything that can destroy the tanks and the infantry moving in, that's what these dive bombers do. And the Germans actually built whistles into these planes that made them extremely loud. Play you some audio and I'll show you some video later when we talk about the Battle of Britain. These things are devastating. They attack at a very steep dive. They built these whistles in so they're really loud. They're going to scare the crap out of you guys. And then they drop their bombs and then pull out of that dive. So they're very accurate, okay, in taking out tanks and artillery. Then here comes your infantry. The infantry moves along with the tank. 
you got the motorcycles, you've got the, the trucks, everybody's moving, and your enemy is overwhelmed. Okay, when, when, when Hitler turns his attention away from Poland and invades Denmark, Belgium, Netherlands, Norway, France, he will, take, he will conquer eight countries. Eight countries in about six weeks. Okay, using blitzkrieg. This is devastating. Okay. So now you have a little bit better idea. So the Messerschmitt is their fighter, which is a formidable fighter. It's a good fighter. And the thing about the Germans is their pilots are already experienced. They're going to be the most experienced of the war. Because of the Spanish Civil War, what they were doing there, and other actions that they took. So these three German planes are of great importance to Blitzkrieg. Okay. Now this picture here I took at the uh, World War II Museum. Uh, and you guys been to Nome? Okay. It used to be called the National D-Day Museum, okay, in New Orleans, but they changed it and made it the, the National World War II Museum. Um, they have it in New Orleans because, have any guys ever seen the movie? <laughs> a few or a few people students have seen this. Saving Private Ryan. Okay, it's all right. Uh, I'm going to show you some clips from it, okay? Uh, I don't know if you've seen D-Day pictures where you have the landing craft, you have the flat-bottom boat that goes in, and then a gate drops down and troops come off. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, those boats were made by a, a boat maker in New Orleans called, uh, they called him Higgins. His name is Higgins. And uh, they used these boats in the swamps, flat-bottom boats in the swamps down in the Delta. And so, um, so um, they, that's why they built that D-Day Museum um, there, okay. All right, so let's keep going here. All right, so just, just kind of, this is repetitive, sorry. Um, air power. Um, Made it possible to leap over standing armies like you couldn't do this very well in World War One, okay, or in any other previous war. Uh, so you can go over, you know, water. You can go over rivers. You can go over mountains. You can, you know, go around people, go over them, uh, strike the heart of a defenseless nation. Uh, now this is important here. Uh, most countries by this time do not have any way to shoot down the planes that are dropping bombs on them. Okay, and boy, talk about being defenseless and scared. This is going to be a thing, right? And so Poland didn't have air defense systems. They didn't have any way to shoot down these planes, okay, other than their own planes. So this is where you get in the dogfights, right? And when you have a Messerschmitt, which is way better than a Polish biplane, who's going to win that dogfight? Yeah, okay. My daughter told me something interesting yesterday. She flew home from Louisville and stopped in Chicago at O'Hare Airport. And I knew this, I just forgot it. But uh, she, she said, you know who the airport's named after? I said, yeah, of course, O'Hare. She goes, well, why did they name it after? So he was the first Navy pilot that was an ace. Okay? And so they named uh, the Chicago airport after. So that's one way to shoot down other planes. Um, now, as we'll find out, guys, Britain will uh, build an air defense system during the Battle of Britain that is pretty darn effective for 1940. Okay, Do we have air defense systems in the United States today? There's one on the White House, right? An aircraft gets too close to the White House in restricted airspace. There's missiles on the roof to shoot those down. That's an air defense system. Okay? Yeah. Like a machine gun? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to hit something moving like that with a machine gun. You know what I mean? You could try, and why not? 
right? I mean, if you're defenseless, I'm firing my machine gun in you. Yes. Okay, but it's not going to be very effective. You may put some holes in it, but chances of bringing it down, not very good. I'm sure it happened at least once during the war. With a machine gun? All right. So, guys, this is a Junkers 88 bomber. Oh, this is actually over London. Here's another picture of a German Messerschmitt fighter. And then this is what a lot of cities across Europe are going to end up looking like. And this, this is the biggest air battle in history um, that's about to happen. Okay? The Germans are uh, getting some good experience here against the Poles. All right? I took these pictures uh, at the National D-Day or World War II Museum in New Orleans and threw them in my notes here. This is a German motorcycle. Uh, but really what I want to talk about is this gun right here. This is one of the most famous weapons of World War II. It's a German 88 millimeter flank gun. Okay, let me just read this to you. Okay, the 88 millimeter flank flak, excuse me, flak gun is one of the most famous guns of World War II. Originally designed as an anti-aircraft gun to shoot at planes in the sky. The flat trajectory, high muzzle velocity, and range of this gun also made it the best anti-tank gun of the war. Allied soldiers faced and feared this gun in every campaign in North Africa, the Mediterranean, and European theater. It was responsible for a great number of casualties suffered by both tank and air crews. Of the 88 millimeter gun, the late Stephen Ambrose, who's a famous World War II author, said those 88s became a legend. It was said that there were more soldiers converted to Christianity by the 88 than Peter and Paul combined. <laughs> Look, this thing, man, it was nasty. The shells on this thing are about this long, okay, and about that wide. Now, you can get this thing to blow up on impact, or you can get the shell to blow up in the air. If you're shooting at a plane in the air, you want it to blow up in the air. It's like a grenade going off in the air, a big one. Okay? The metal around this grenade is going to shred out, shred out what's called flak. And the hope is, rather than using a machine gun, this metal will go into the cockpit or into the engine of these planes and bring them down. Okay, so flak is something you should be familiar with. Flak guns, puffs of black smoke, or as pilots and crews called it, flak death. Okay, because those things were exploding all around them. Now, the Poles didn't have these. Now, in the, we'll talk about the Battle of the Bulge at the end of World War II in Europe. In the forest, in a dense forest, the Germans were using these guns to explode inside in the trees, not on impact, but in the treetops. And when those shells went off in the treetops, sent out millions of little pieces, shards of wood, shrapnel into human flesh. We had 81,000 casualties in the Battle of the Bull, mostly due to this gun. Okay, so I, I wanted to talk about it and bring it up because this thing is, uh, is a terror, okay, on the Allies, all right? Okay, so now, any idea what time this class is up? Every day, 35. <laughs> so how long is my class? 45 minutes. <laughs> All right, all right. Now, Poland is conquered, right? By the end of August, excuse me, by the end of September, okay? August, comes after August. September, wait, we already did September. September, okay, end of September. Okay, what comes after September? October, November, December, January, February, March. Six months. 
There's no fighting in Europe. This is referred to as the phony war. The phony war will end April 9th. Okay, and if you look at this, these notes here, okay, Norway, Denmark, Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, France. April, May, June 14th. Six countries, nine weeks, not six weeks. Is that right? My week's good here. Eight weeks, nine weeks. Nine weeks, right? Jeez, look at a calendar, Mr. Reed, right? Nine. Yeah, nine. nine. Okay. How many countries? Six countries, nine weeks. What the Germans couldn't do in four years in World War I, they will do in nine weeks. Now, that's good. That's going to be up there for a minute. Now, this is one of the most famous pictures of World War II. Hitler standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. Okay, guys, when the when the Germans surrendered in World War One, at the end of World War One, remember the eleventh hour, the eleventh day, and the eleventh month on uh, November of ni uh, nineteen eighteen, right? Uh, Armistice Day, now we call it Veterans Day, yes? Okay. The Germans were forced to sign surrender in a railroad car. Okay. And the French took that railroad car, lifted it off the tracks, and they built a park around it in Paris. And there was that tra railroad car in Paris that had a nice garden around it. This is where World War I ended, this train car. Guess what? Hitler's going to force the French to surrender in that same train car in Paris. And this man is ecstatic. There's video of this where Hitler's just like, he's just like, I can't believe I'm getting to do this to the French. Okay. These sons of guns, remember those war reparations? Remember what the French did with the Treaty of Versailles, the vindictiveness? Yeah. Okay, everything Hitler's been talking about. Since the early 20s, it's coming to a fruition, okay? Now, this photograph published in American newspapers, British newspapers, this is going to scare the dickens out of people, guys. I mean, it could be within a few weeks, Hitler could be taking the same picture in front of Big Ben in London Bridge. And before too long, in front of the Statue of Liberty. This man is on a mission, okay? But he's got to knock Britain out of the war. Now, before I get there, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I'm going to draw a map up on the board. I need a blank slate here. That one works. All right. Yeah. All right, help me out. Okay. Check this out. Where is my freaking blue? That's true. All right, let's play. What's this? Ireland. Stop. What's the capital? What's this body of water right here? It wasn't on your homework. It's called the English Channel. 
This is one of the most important bodies of water in human history. It really is. Yeah, I, I read an incredible, incredible fiction book once called Ceremonies about this thick, and it's about the history of England, dating back to where there was there was a land bridge. There, there was no channel there. And then there was a channel there, and everything changed. Okay? The narrowest point between here and here is 20 miles. The narrowest point. There have been people that have swam across the English Channel. Okay? Not an easy task. It's generally got fast currents, waves, jellyfish. <laughs> Goodness, does it have jellyfish? All right, stop with the jellyfish. What country is this? Capital? Country? No. Belgium? Capital? Brussels? Country? Ooh, no. I'm on this one. <laughs> Somebody just said it. Netherlands. Capital. Amsterdam. Good. All right. What we got up here? What's the bottom of it? <laughs> Norway. Capital. Ah. Slow. Country. Denmark. Denmark. Capital. Copenhagen. I was close. All right. This is another one. All right. Germany. Germany, capital. This is Austria, sorry. And this uh, Vienna, right? What's this? Italy. Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. What? Capital. Italy's down here. Czech. Capital. Rock. Poland. Warsaw. Warsaw. The motherland. Capital. Moscow. All right, now. This is what's going on. All right, you got Nazi Germany, right? They took over Austria. Yep. Took over the Sudan land. Remember this? They rearmed the Rhineland. Yes. Okay, took the rest of Czechoslovakia six months later, Munich Pact, right? Nazis took over here. Okay, the phony war, the six month period. Now, remember one of the things Hitler had built during his rebuilding of Germany was his highway system called the Autobahn. We talked about this, the Autobahn. Okay, so what Hitler's going to do over the next six months is move his armies from Poland using his Autobahn into position to invade Western Europe. Okay? Now, his first conquer. Now, one of the things I just want to say, remember, Hitler signed a non-aggression pact with Russia. He's going to sign a non-aggression pact with Denmark. He's going to sign a non-aggression pact with Norway. He's going to sign a non-aggression pact with the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. Every country he invaded, he signed a non-aggression pact. That's a death knell. If you sign this agreement with it, okay? He's a liar. Dictators tend to be liars. You understand that, right? Now, the French, since the end of World War I, have been busy building defensive barriers here. This is a 350-mile-long barrier of defenses called the Maginot Line. Now, they do not build this up along the border with Belgium. This is Luxembourg, right? What's the capital of Luxembourg? Luxembourg City. Now, if I draw all these dots here, you look at this on a map, what do all these dots represent? It's hilly there, but... Did you 
shake freckles? <laughs> trees. It's trees. Or a bunch of trees together, we call a forest. forest. Yes, a dense forest called the Ardennes, sometimes referred to as the Black Forest. Okay, right here. Okay, so French are going to sit smugly behind the Maginot Line. First target, Denmark. Remember the fifth column? There were already supporters there. A lot of favor for the Nazis, okay? They're going to use for the first time, guys, paratroopers. People jumping out of planes. You got to go. People jumping out of planes on purpose. Parachutes, right? So they're going to use these paratroopers in Denmark to secure key areas, bridges, and so forth. Uh, Netherlands and Belgium. So... But here, the fighting will last about two weeks in Denmark. They surrender. There will be resistance. Now, they're going to use the Trojan horse method in Norway. I'm just, I got time. Okay. If you look at Norway, guys, along this coastline of Norway are a lot of really good harbors and ports. Okay. It is strategic up here with the North Sea. And your next target is going to be Britain after all this is over. So you're getting on their flank here if you can take these. So what the Germans did, guys, is they sent in cargo ships into Norwegian ports near dusk, okay, before it got dark, but they pulled in, and then the sun set. And when the sun went down, okay, inside these cargo ships were soldiers and tanks. And so they took control of these port cities along the western coast, which would allow the Germans to use military vessels here to patrol the North Sea and take airfields to bomb Britain later on. Okay, now the Norwegians will continue to fight throughout the entire war. And I just watched a movie on this. A couple, there's a couple good movies on this. I wish I could remember the name of the one I just watched. Uh, I think we rented it recently. Any of you guys see this? The one where they were. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see it? No, I'm not. Anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. We just like came out like recently. We just rented it. So I figured other people rent movies too, right? Well, there's this guy. Okay, well, that's really good. Was it on Apple? They went into, uh, they went into Norway. And uh, blew up some German ships and stuff, and then they got caught. And one guy has managed to escape. And he needed to stay alive so he could tell the story of what happened to the other men. He was like working with the British. Maybe? Okay. Anyway, this is, there's a guy named Max Manis. He's from Norway. And what he's going to do is he is going to sneak over to Britain. This is throughout the entire war, after the Nazis controlled the west coast of Norway. He will get explosives, TNT, and stuff like that, sneak back into Norway, and attach explosives to German ships, and blow them up under the cover of darkness. They were like a thorn in the side of the Nazis during the entire war. This resistance, this Norwegian resistance. That named Max Manus, there's a movie called Max Manus. Okay. Now, the Germans will not take all of Norway, just the west coast, though, okay? Because the Norwegians continue to fight throughout the war. They will resist, okay? Good? So, now, the Trojan horse. Then the Netherlands and Belgium. Now, the guys, these are referred to as the low countries. So, this is something that is repeating history from World War I. It's called the Schiefen Plan, named after World War I German general that invaded France through the Netherlands and Belgium. Now, the French didn't think that the Germans would be able to break through the Maginot Line. They thought it was impregnable. Okay? It wasn't. They didn't think they would cut through the Ardennes Forest because it's hard to bring a mechanized army through a dense forest that's hilly and it's got rivers and stuff like that. Have you heard of German engineering? 
Yeah, so German engineers are going to clear paths for a mechanized army through the Ardennes Fort. All right? So they're going to attack on three fronts here into France. All right? And they'll break through here. Here's Paris, okay? They're going to cut to the coast and then fan out. These people will, because there's British and French troops in here, okay? And they will drive these guys back to the coast here. Okay, so as soon as... Poland was invaded. Britain started sending troops over to France. Okay. And so when they come in with the Schieffen plan, like they did in World War I, it's going to work for the Germans. Guys, France will fall in two weeks. Two weeks. This is one of the strongest countries in the world. Remember, they were the first to make, break the five power treaty. Okay, they've been preparing for this, but they didn't prepare well enough. Okay, I'm going to finish that story tomorrow, and I don't even have to really like worry about where I'm at because this is where we're at. Okay, Battle of Britain tomorrow. Got, actually, I think I go. I think I go back a step, talk about America for a little bit, and then I'm going to do the Battle of Britain, which is pretty awesome. Okay. And I'm going to give you way more information than you need to know. Have a great day, guys.